Welcome, 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 beautiful woman of sexy confidence. I am so excited to be here today for a special live stream with my glorious colleague Ria Bloom. And I'm going to <clears throat> invite Ria on screen. I want to make sure that she's able to see us. Um, All right, so Ria will be with us here shortly, and I'm so incredibly excited to bring her on with us and really create this exquisite, beautiful uh, dive into you understanding the six stages of your exquisite sexuality. Hi, Sandra, lovely to see you. And I'm waiting for Ria. I want to make sure that she is here with me and you're able to dive into this really, really juicy and exquisite topic. So um, I want to make sure that Ria can see me. Ah, there she is, glorious woman. All right. All right. Hey, darling. So beautiful to have you here with me today. Thank you so much for stepping into this space. Yeah, it's cool. Mm. This morning, good morning to you and speaking for me. Oh, it's so good to see you, beautiful. So happy to be here. I'm just such a huge fan of yours. And I just love sexy confidence. I mean, does it get any better than that? <laughs> Everyone wants to be sexy and confident, but not everyone actually acknowledges that out loud, right? <laughs> mm, mm, yes, and confidence is extraordinarily sexy. I mean, if we could just feel comfortable and confident in our skin, right? I mean, it's like beyond just comfortable, it's like confident to then exude and radiate uh, beauty and love. It's just absolutely phenomenal. Such an incredible thing. So happy to be here, Dagmar. Yes, thank you so much. And I'm so incredibly honored to have you here with me and mm. dive into the topic that I would say is very misunderstood and deeply underexplored. Mm. And at the same time, it offers like just an exquisite framework for people to understand themselves, their impulses, their behaviors, their desires which is the six stages of sexuality. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and before we dive into that, I would love for you to um, really, really introduce yourself and Richard, introduce like your story. How did you come to work with sexuality and what was your kind of journey to awakening into this sexual education path? Um, share that with us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So, you know, I was in social organizational psychology, so business psychology, which is extraordinarily fascinating to work with organizations and companies and all the multiple levels and dynamics in which people operate. And something felt kind of empty in the boardroom, if you will. And the big elephant in the room is sexuality. You know, here we have these powerful leaders and powerful organizations that come together and everyone is like buttoned up to the neck, you know, and there's this underlying um, disconnection to our bodies and we all become these like talking heads and there's just so much more to, to the world and to life. And I didn't realize um, my own wounding around my body and sexuality. And so I was lucky enough to stumble upon polyamory and open relationships. I was living in New York City at the time, and there's a huge, you know, burner, um, underground, you know, sex party scene. And I got involved with it. And I was, I finally felt liberated and alive because I went from completely not acknowledging my own sexuality, my own body. I was a, a talking head, you know disconnected. 
And when I found the burner scene and self-expression and sex parties, it really opened something up. Uh, but then as I kept exploring further and went down the, the journey of Tantra and sacred sexuality, I realized the nuance and the subtleties and energy and how important it is to really deeply be connected to my values, to my heart, and really listen to my body, that my body is constantly speaking to me. And it's such a rich journey to go inward, to really, you know, go on this path of self-acceptance. And part of self-acceptance is sexuality, that I am a sexual being, that being born in this human body is such an extraordinary gift. And so I stumbled upon uh, something called ISTA, International School of Temple Arts, and they do trainings all around the world. I am honored and extraordinarily grateful to be organizing the first training in Japan this year, this November, which is huge because my father's Japanese. I was born and raised in Japan and bringing sacred sexuality to my fatherland to a country and a culture, you know, that doesn't talk about feelings, you know, let alone um, sexuality, it's going to be extraordinary. And it, it just, it gives me goosebumps, you know, and uh, yeah, super, super excited. And I really, when I learned about the six stages of sexual development, it was such an aha moment to have this framework, be able to then, you know, give me the perspective of what I've been through in my journey because there were so many ups and downs and finally getting to a place where I can have self-acceptance and find peace and really thrive in my sexuality, in my relationships with my body and in my life. I'm just so grateful to really, you know, pass this knowledge on that has been extraordinarily healing for me, extraordinarily, um, expansive in my journey. So super excited to dive right into this. That's, yeah. incredible. That's incredible. So what I really love, uh, what you're sharing about the six stages of sexuality is that it is a framework and yes. knowing, um, working with so many women, especially around sexual pain and sexual trauma. Uh, I know like diving into the sexuality is such a terrifying piece for most women. And to me, having a framework that you're going to share with us, I'm so excited about, it's like giving the context mind, giving the intellectual mind the really space to orient itself. Mm. So then, you know, eventually when, let's say, dive into JDAC practices or breath work or sensuality mm. training or healing your shame or whatever the piece is, whatever the pieces are, you're oriented, you're being oriented within the framework that is safety, it is psychological safety, and it really allows people, allows women to have a roadmap around uh, around moving, around that experience, and around that feeling of feeling is required, or around you know deepening their pleasure or deepening their connection with that so that they're growing at. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. So good. It's really true, you know, like the body, um, I'm sure you, you talk a lot about this, is the nervous system, right? And we're constantly um, checking our environment to see, are you a friend? Are you a foe? Are you a friend? Are you a foe? And the mind is designed for survival, right? Like the mind is, is wired and is the lens in which we make sure we're safe. And so really giving the mind a chance to, like, you know, the, the, the metaphoric, like give it a hammock and a pina colada to just like, kind of <laughs> kind of like, like give it a vacation, you know, because it's like constantly going, you know, it's like, give your mind a vacation or like just invite it to like, have a nice comfortable seat on a really beautiful pillow, <laughs> give it a nice little shoulder rub at, or a hug and say, hey, we're gonna be all right. You know, we're on this journey together, mind, body, heart, spirit, soul, like, don't worry, we've got you. You don't have to be, you know, driving this thing called life by yourself. And part of that is, you know, the framework of the, the six stages of really 
recognizing that it's, it's all beautiful wherever you are on this path. And to really know that there's going to be the next stage mm-hmm. that we get to develop into and grow into, which is beautiful because the mind loves progress. We love to know that we're moving forward. <laughs> There you go. Love this. Yes. Mind loves progress. Yes. So let's dive right into it. Let's dive right into yes. the stages. Uh, the first one being innocence. Sexual. Yes. Tell us about sexual. Absolutely. I'm sure um, you as a mother, you know, have gotten to really witness this in, in, in your baby and that we are all born completely innocent. You know, we're born into this world. Uh, mom and dad had sex, you know, for most of us, like some of us, maybe a little bit of science was involved. Maybe a lot of praying was involved. Great. But for most of us, you know, sexuality and sex, not just sperm and the egg, but it's life force energy. And we're born into this world completely innocent, you know, delicate and sweet. And really, it's about, it's not so much about sexuality, um, but it's about pleasure. And the body is pleasurable. You know, we have nerve endings and our cute, adorable little you know, born dumpling body is full of nerve endings and we're extraordinarily sensitive. So just knowing that the first stage that every single one of us was born completely innocent without any imprint, uh, absolutely, you know, a blank slate, if you will, of just pure pleasure. And there's been some studies where they found some fetuses in utero wrapping their legs around the umbilical cord, you know, because of the developing genitals, uh, whether, you know, a boy or a girl, as the genitals come together and form, are, you know, open, uh, pleasurable nerve endings. And can you just picture an umbilical cord? It's like this squishy, squishy, you know, long thing that we get to um, move ourselves and gyrate against. So it's just about knowing that we were born completely innocent, free, just sexual beings. Just, you know, if you could remember a time when you were a kid and you were touching yourself, like touching your genitals because it just felt good. Or you would run around naked, you know, because you're like, why do I have to wear these tight elastic underwear, you know, that cuts the circulation and I can't feel any air. You know, like there's a lot of moments I can remember personally of my mother or, you know, an adult telling me to do something. And I'm like, why, why are we doing that? Mm-hmm. You know, like it doesn't make sense. And I remember going to bed naked as a little kid and just feeling extraordinarily free in my body, in my expression, in my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is beautiful. And it's, um, yeah, it creates such a, such an beautiful invitation of remembrance of that mm-hmm. sense and that pure pure sense of wonder um and i remember in my own sexual healing journey when i have been invited to you know, reclaim this lost piece of myself the innocence in well very very tender and mm-hmm. a lot of grief a lot of um stored and unhealed emotional pain and at the same time, the tremendous sense of like all and capacity for um, like really, really what is available for me to feel in my body. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. All right. So we are in the second stage, which is conditioning, and I think. Mm-hmm. We are- things start to become <laughs> different. So <laughs> tell us about the conditioning part. Yes. Well, so, you know, imagine this uh, newborn dumpling who's like, oh my God, what is this thing? This is my body. It's so pleasurable. And we are born into a world that already exists. And the world that already exists teaches us, you know, how to speak, how to act, how to behave, what's okay, what's not okay inappropriate, appropriate language words, right? So whereas the world of innocence was uh, probably pre-rational, so just sensations and feelings before words, before logic 
I mean, you know, your brain's barely developed. <laughs> You're just like coming into this world with feelings and sensations and then bam, stage two is where all the conditioning happens. You know, that's private, don't touch yourself, that's shameful, that's dirty, no. All of this um, programming that we get and conditioning around what's inappropriate and not appropriate just completely shuts us down. The world in which we live, whether it's religion, whether it's, you know, waking up in the morning at a certain time and having to go to school, institutions, uh, you know, your parents, just the hustle and bustle of life that already exists when you're tender, as you put it, uh, can really shut our sexuality down. So the stage two is all the conditioning we've ever heard or learned from TV, media, music, movies, you know, from our peers, especially our peers. You know, if you're a, a kid or even a teenager, you know, growing up and you ask your teenage friends for advice or you confide in them about your body or something you're going through, do you think you're going to get good advice from another teenager? You know, probably not. They probably got it from someone else. So this is the stage in which we completely shut down and pick up all the things that are opposite to what we we're born with, which was the pureness and the innocence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're sharing is that at the core of us, the innocence space, it remains, it never, uh, it's been removed from mm -hmm. our sexuality. And the conditioning is literally like this, um, you know, negative shame, repressed people that is grounded in the innocence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So the innocence uh, doesn't really necessarily leave us because we're, we are innocent, right, at our core. And the conditioning really just shuts down the innocence. We, it really disconnects us from the core and the original way in which we were born because we learn language. And the moment we learn language, everything that we can't put a word to kind of gets thrown in the back burner. It's no longer important. You know, if I can't point a finger at something and give it a name and like touch it, 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 it kind of ceases to exist. It, it kind of goes into, you know, the peripheral and it's no longer important. And we're so wired for belonging. We really want to be accepted and to belong. And especially, you know, I remember uh, preteen to teenage years, I mean, my goodness, I veered so far away from who I am or who I was to just fit in. That was my number one priority in life at that age was to just fit in. It was survival. It was like, you know, do or die. And I was no longer connected to my body. And I absorbed everything that I learned from the media everything I learned from my surroundings, whether it was my parents, my teachers, my peers, really um, learning all of the curse words and derogatory terms in my high school and middle school growing up were something sexual, right? So if you did a sexual act, you were considered, you know, dirty and disgusting and, you know, a slut. And like, there's all these names, like, you know, I'm sure if we look up Urban Dictionary, you'll come up with all the names of all the different, very specific sexual acts that, you know, get you kicked out of your circle of friends. And so in this stage, we are disconnected when it's fascinating because we're going through puberty. Our hormones are like alive and rampant and, and going wild. And at such a tender place in our awakening and our development and in our initiation into adulthood to then get this conditioning and shut it down it's like double trauma mm -hmm. yeah that everyone carries and no one knows about yes mm. wow I already like yeah my, my mind is already blown thank you so much <laughs> so the third stage is pushed through. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm actually really, really curious. What is this about? Yes. So, you know, even though we completely get shut down in stage two with conditioning because we're wired to belong, we're wired to just absorb and learn 
whatever it is that's going to help us to fit in with our friends and our family, we need our sexuality. I mean, this is like, you know, core to being a human being, even though we're civilized and we wear clothes and, you know, we, we do certain things and don't do other things. We're still living in an animal body. You know, we have a nervous system and blood flow and we're wired to have sexual energy. I mean, the genitalia, it's, it's extraordinarily pleasurable. It's also a creative center. So we have our innocence and on top of that, we have conditioning. And now it's like, we got to like really push through all of the, the layers and just act. So it's almost rebellious. It's um, maybe, I think, by stage three, you've had a couple of lovers. By now, you've engaged sexually, so maybe young adulthood to uh, late teenage years, depending. And you're like, this, this, is, this really sucks, you know, but you're forcing it and really moving through it in a very aggressive way. So stage three, there's a lot of force to it. There's a lot of um, pretending on top of our innocence, our original essence. And in stage two, like the conditioning, we're trying to like push it. We're not necessarily doing anything with it. It's still there. It's very much there. And so we have to get through and find the cracks and just like be very forceful. So, you know, if I think about my own push through stage, it was, you know, I started having sex when I was 14 years old. I was in love with my high school sweetheart. And I was so ashamed of having sex with my boyfriend, who I was completely in love with. Uh, but because of the culture that I grew up in, I had to hide it and keep it hidden. But then I would do things like on the weekend, you know, go drinking and get tipsy and use alcohol as a way to kind of uh, inebriate me to be able to then, you know, engage sexually and feel, feel as if I was liberated, you know, but then there were consequences of a lot of shame and a lot of guilt that would come up from these uh, rebellious binging acts, if you will. Hmm. Yeah. I think so many women can like really, really resonate with this, um, that early, late teens, early 20s, like having so much rebellion and needing mm -hmm. new substances to um, mm -hmm. sort of bypass some of the subtle voices in the head, right? The voices of conditioning mm -hmm. and, you know, emerge into that state of rebellion in order to actually engage sexually or have... Um, sexual experience with ever form and shape that is um, and would really, really be in that. And I would mm -hmm. say, uh, and I would really love to know your thoughts on this, people who have things like sexual addiction, would you say that there mm -hmm. is a difference of like being stuck in uh, the rebellion of things? Well, it's you know, with... It's yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I have mixed feelings about this, right? So I absolutely think addiction, uh, there's something there with addiction, right? I don't necessarily personally believe in sexual addiction, uh, you know, but I think addiction itself, whether it's alcohol, cigarettes, food, you know, sugar, caffeine, or sex, addiction is a, a coping mechanism. It's a strategy to, you know, get us away from feeling pain or whatever it is that we're feeling or we're trying to numb, right? So we're trying to change the way we feel and we cope by having uh, unhealthy addictive habits to help us. Now, sexual addiction, uh, it's a very interesting one. I think it's on a case by case scenario with certain people, but you know, I think just some of the research I've done around sexual addiction there is this lens that, you know, sex is shameful, right? So it, there's already this lens that you're, you're only supposed to have sex in very specific conditions, married, you know, monogamously with one partner, uh, you're supposed to be a virgin before you have it. Like there's all these conditionings around like what's appropriate and what's inappropriate and it's so narrow that if someone veers off of that narrow definition of what's acceptable, 
then they start uh, using labels like sexual addiction. Um, and it's possible if it's unhealthy, then absolutely it's part of the stage three of just like forceful pushing through, kind of ignoring what's healthy to myself without, there's like no self-reflection, right? In stage three, we're not really thinking about, is this good for me? Do I really want this? Have I really thought this through? What's the impact? What's the cost on myself and the people around me? Uh, what's really, is this really in alignment to my values? None of this has happened at this point, you know, because it's just completely unconscious and we're just, it's very forceful. Yeah. Push through, forceful. Wow. Yeah. All right. Let's dive into stage four. This covered. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> so discovery is exactly that. There's the thought of like, wait a minute maybe there's a better way that, you know, all of this has to happen. And in stage four is the first time where you really think maybe everything we learned in stage two was total BS. <gasps> like maybe, you know, everything I learned, like I went to health class in um, high school and they were teaching us abstinence, right? Not really about safer sex or condoms or like any of this stuff, but they were like, just don't have sex, you know? There was even someone who said, hey, if you, if you masturbate, you might break out on your hands with hives. There was like all this strange talk. And as a kid, you're just like, well, if an adult's saying this, you know, like, uh-oh, maybe that's going to happen. But then finally in stage four, they're like, that's utter BS. None of this happened. Those teachers who were teaching me about sexual education, they weren't having any sex. They weren't practicing abstinence. They were just, you know, not dating or having any sex at all. So how easy for them to tell us horny teenagers to just don't do it. And so in stage four, maybe you join an awesome group called Sexy Confidence. You know, maybe you pick up a book or you start YouTubing and really looking into different uh, coaching or courses or programs to say, hey, there has to be a better way. I think, you know, I got a lot of BS taught to me and I was really forceful and I rebelled against this, but then I kind of hurt myself. It was a little harmful mm -hmm. to, to my spirit, to my body in stage three. And so in stage four, we're trying to rectify and heal this, um, the, the trauma and the hurt that we didn't realize uh, we were putting on ourselves by pushing through and being forceful around the conditioning. Mm. Yeah. Wow, mm. amazing. So the discovery is really about like finding the answers and yeah, stepping on a healing path, stepping on a deep healing yes. path, uh, which mm. is really sort of like even the sexuality and healing in transcendence, such a revolutionary concept for most people. Everyone associates sex with intercourse and pleasure and orgasm. And in, uh, in my own words, our sexual healing is such a huge aspect of how it supports women getting out of pain in the state of pleasure. And now mm -hmm. we're talking really about this entire stage of someone going through their deep healing journey in order to unravel the conditioning and the different impulses for pushing through so they can ultimately like reclaim the whole self, the whole sexual self. Mm-hmm. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. stage five. Ooh, I'm really intrigued Ooh. by sacred <laughs> sexuality. Sacred mm. sexuality. Yes. So you know in stage four we finally have the aha and realize there's gotta be a better way. We start our healing journey. And we heal all the trauma from forcing, you know, and pushing through stage three and all the conditioning. And now, you know, we heal all of that. And when we heal all of it, we get to come back to almost neutral. We kind of get back our innocence. But this stage four of innocence is as an adult, right? We're already having sex. We're having partners. We're engaging as an adult sexuality, which is uh, different in quality. And in stage five, it goes even beyond just the neutral heel journey. But now we're 
going into a realm of knowing that my sex is sacred and not sacred as in limited and it, that it's special because it's limited, but sacred and that it's holy, that my orgasms and the goddess and being born in this body is a gift that I can connect to the divine and to the universe and to nature, you know, to God, to the goddess, to the spirit uh, and beyond that it's a form of awakening and really um, opening up, you know, the, the different chakra systems and to just know that I can really channel my sexuality and my creative energy as a spiritual path, that there's something really, really beautiful to my sexuality. So I can then lean into my sexual energy and practice things like sex magic and channeling the orgasmic energy and the power for manifestation, you know, whether it's uh, wanting a, a delicious new partner or business venture or money or, you know, uh, really uh, bringing the health of my family and my friends into my prayers that my sex and my orgasms and my body, my sexuality is my prayer into the universe. That if I am this embodied goddess walking amongst the earth, I get to radiate this energy out into the world. So it goes even beyond the healing journey and it goes towards expansion and enlightenment. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Total goosebumps. Absolute absolute goosebumps. Um, wow. I feel that every woman who is on like a spiritual awakening path or conscious path, like mm. that's what she's hungry for. And mm. the core is that's what she really, really wants to step into and uh, journey through. And at the same time, it seems to be many times like, like such an unattainable island of meaning. Mm. The amount of women I'm speaking to every single day that you know can orgasm only in a state of shame or only mm. in a state of like being so disconnected from their body, that sense of wonder, sense of oneness, and that, that deep pain. Like, you can literally feel how visceral that pain is around having a different experience, having that state of oneness and unity and divine connection is so palpable and I have um, uh, I have literally never heard anyone speaking about it more beautiful than me now for mm. yeah <laughs> thank you it's so beautiful mm. yes it's true yeah. you know we're in so much pain uh, when we are having orgasms under the, the guise of shame, right? And guilt and societal conditioning. So then the, the sexual experience kind of gets reinforced as shameful, right? So when we're having, uh, whether it's self-pleasure or making love, when we are opening up our bodies into this vulnerable states of you know, sexual energy, and then on top of that, there's shame, without proper, you know, perhaps guidance or knowing and remembering that, that my sexuality and my, my orgasm, my pleasure is my prayer. It's, it's beautiful. It's healing. It's nourishing that it's, uh, it's something to really be celebrated and, and, um, you know, really like have so much reverence for, uh, to then rewire that, to come out of that into this place of perhaps exploring Tantra, uh, exploring, you know, sacred sexuality. There's so many different branches and studies. But to just know that I am uh, a physical embodiment of the divine, that I, that I come from the goddess herself. And my yoni and my body is a temple, a temple that's not... Cause, so, you know, it's interesting, right? Like, so my mother, I remember at a young age, she was like, Rhea, your body is a temple. And I'm yeah. like, 
cool. That's so cool. Okay, so what does that mean? And she's like, that means don't let anyone touch it. And I was like, what? That's so sad. You know, it's like, we have this idea that that temples, you put these like barbed wires, or even like, you know, VIP section at a club, there's like these red ropes, these velvet ropes that kind of like stay away, only for the elite, you know, only for the best. But really, I mean, the temple space is where you come to, to bring to bring yourself, you bring your sorrows, you bring your joy, you bring your hopes and your grief and your fantasies. And you come to the temples for healing, you know, for manifestation, you come to give yourself and that really these sacred temples are meant to be shared. They're meant to be visited. (laughs) They're meant to be, (laughs) you know, the keyboard here. You meant to visit yourself down there quite often. No, that's right. When your husband is desperate. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like th- this can be a little controversial, but beyond that, it's like you know, my temple and my genitals are—they're not mine. You know, I think they're mine, but they're not mine. They're meant to be shared. <laughs> And visited, you know, from near to far, you know, uh, travel across. It's a pilgrimage to come to these sacred places and come in honor, come in reverence, come uh, to give and to dedicate, you know, for a higher, beautiful uh, manifestation, whether it's peace or abundance or health, wealth, love. It's really something to be explored and, and celebrated. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i am uh personally um uh, in definitely the stage of uh, discovery i'm going to like massive healing journey and mm. i taste it i had like these glimpses of taste of the sacred sexuality and mm. um i've experienced that with my husband we are together for 14 years and it has literally given us the doorway of this you know, unexplainable connection, unexplainable one mm. and unity and like literally having that visceral sense that we are better together, we can create something better together than having our journey. And um, it is without a question, the medicine that every single one can do is to do. Every single every single, you know, uh, uh, container of togetherness, we really, really need to have a door in the world, otherwise it happens. It's like uh, people get upset and it will create such a deep, visceral wounding. Then more often, mm-hmm. it's to break up with separation, it's to sex addiction, it's to porn addiction. I mean, it is Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah I mean you know you really um, hit the nail on the head with medicine right so even even if let's just hypothetically we live in an ideal world and we had the perfect childhood no conditioning uh, we we get to skip you know stage two three and four and we just go straight from one to five right let's just pretend hypothetically you know even then we're still born into a world where other people are suffering. And, you know, even if we have the perfect childhood and the perfect relationship and the perfect life, there are other people who don't. And other people are really in need of medicine. And so sacred sexuality in stage five, if you can come from a place of uh, medicine and, uh, you know, showing people to remember, hey, it's okay, and that you can come back to your body, you're safe, you can feel pleasure, it's okay, you don't have to constantly be running around surviving all the time, that it is very, very medicinal. And it can be extraordinarily healing for couples who have gone through quite the journey to be able to just put everything down. It's like, hey, if you want to pick it back up, you can. You can pick up all the complaints. You can pick back up the luggage after, but let's just put it down for a second. 
and just really connect from the soul. Uh, so often, you know, like stage, I would say stage two, three, two and three mostly, and then, you know, four, it's really the personal journey, right? Like the personality, very earthly journey. Uh, and that stage five, similar to stage one, there's something very ethereal about it. There's very something um, spiritual in quality. It's transpersonal. It's beyond just the personality and really being able to meet yourself on, a, on that level, on that uh, soul level. And to meet your lover on that soul level can just instantaneously heal, you know, trauma that we've been working with for years. Because we live in a traumatized world that just reinforces the trauma. And if the world had a personality, the world doesn't want you to awaken. The world wants to keep you shut down. The world wants to keep you disconnected. Because if you start speaking the truth about connection and you start really connecting, it's going to force the world to then look at itself. It's going to then be a mirror to the world. You know, hey, you're going to have to look at the pain that you're causing and look at the pain that you're in. Because the only way through the pain is through it. It's by really... Yes, feeling is the pain. superpower. Feeling is the superpower. Mm -hmm. And you're touching on something so incredibly important. So I was mm -hmm. on a call uh, with an amazing woman the other day, and we we're talking about the opportunity of us working together as she's mm -hmm. going through pretty much a crisis in her marriage. And there was, um, you know, a lot of pain for her around kind of, you know, I'm going to invest this amount of money, and all the sort of story around, oh, my husband is asshole, it's not going to work because he is an asshole, and like all sort of da -di da -di da And at the core, it boils down, like literally for her, you know what, I would rather get this word than actually going through this possibly like, healing journey with you and mm. staying down on my knees because it's not going to work. And that, mm. that manifestation to what, you, what you just shared, it's like people are really clear of going through that pain and going through like really feeling and experiencing and journeying through the rest mm. of that lives inside of their bodies. And mm -hmm. that question like what I had to do in my own journey when I was feeling from, you know, kidnap of my son and the pattern around stepping in the presence of the mother and just everything to do with sexuality, every fucking thing on the planet, there was, um, I really had to step into the place of being willing to be present with my team. It was like literally, I felt like I didn't want to fall apart, but I had to be in that team. And the glimpses of my journey and the conception, the conception of my, uh, of my group, of my boy Rumi, what absolutely is a sacred sexuality? Mm. It was the most, one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I felt just spirit literally that the day me and my husband had conceived our baby, I felt the spirit in my room, and it mm. was breathtaking, life changing experience. Mm. Ah, so nourishing. Ooh, I feel it in my chest, in my heart, in my shoulders. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. You're, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, you know, words uh, fail to describe the, the fullness and the richness. It's like, it's so decadent. It's, it's the best part of humanity. It's the best part of, of being alive. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> All right. See, acceptance. Yes. Mm, mm. Beautiful. So, you know, uh, just like in many spiritual circles or groups, there's this idea of ascension, right? Like of going up, right? So we, we have this, uh, whether it's, you know, we think heavens above us or our higher self, we really idealize. Uh, height, 
and going up and upward mobility, right? And so even in the sacred sexuality stage of stage five, you're really like, oh my God, the goddess. Oh, my orgasms are a prayer. And you come from this really excruciating place of, of stage two and three. And then finally in stage four, you have a massive breakthrough. And then in stage five, you just keep going up and up and up. And you know, you think it's gonna keep going, but if you do, you know, your head might just explode. So in stage six, something happens where it really clicks. And it's stage six and acceptance is this really grounding coming home feeling where you realize in acceptance that, oh my goodness, all of the stages are beautiful. That I accept that I have been through every single stage and they are all beautiful. They were all part of my journey that I celebrate and I accept all of the stages, even the most painful of stages, you know, even stage two conditioning. I'm so grateful to have been conditioned. I'm so grateful to go through stage three of forcing through and, and traumatizing myself. I'm so grateful and I accept stage four of the discovery of sacred sexuality. And when you get to a stage six, there's something that happens where you really touch back down to earth after having tasted heaven. And in stage six of acceptance, it's really bringing heaven on earth where you, you are embodied and you accept your sexuality and you might still you know, fluctuate up and down, but you recognize everything's okay. There's this real deep sense of harmony, living in your body, living in your skin, finding peace. And in stage six, when you look at other people, your friends, your family, your partner, your beloved, your children, you know, your parents, you can recognize what stage they're in and it's okay. You know, because if we're in a different stage, we might push and force our stage or our knowledge uh, onto other people, or we might point the finger and judge them or criticize them or name call them. But if you can get to a place of stage six, you're like, wow, I love you just the way you are, no matter where you are, no matter who you are. And what a beautiful place, right? Because if you can be in that space of total acceptance, nothing matters. Like nothing will get you down because even if someone really close to you is having the worst day possible, you can look at them with loving eyes. If you, you look at them with total reverence and honoring and respecting their journey, respecting their path, respecting that there's these different stages that people need to go through. And only when you can rub your nose in the stage, can you really collect wisdom from it? There's just certain things in life that you have to go through to get it, right? And absolutely, there are hacks, there are ways to um, be guided and to skip through extra harm or extra uh, damage and to avoid that. But this, the natural development itself is a natural development. Mm -hmm. So in stage six, it's just accepting that all the stages, all the stages are beautiful. <laughs> amazing beautiful so yeah you invite the like the fitness consciousness and beautiful broad platinum around the possibilities and means of human experiences and it's profound compassion towards mm -hmm. other people's lives yes amazing mm, yes yes total compassion it's compassion for yourself, for what you've been through, you know, compassion for all the things you did that were harmful to yourself and to other people. And you're in a stage of real, you know, true forgiveness is really surrendering. And it's extraordinarily it takes courage. It mm. takes courage and only the brave can really surrender <laughs> and, and, and really forgive. Actually, so Which, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's so counterintuitive, right? Because the world teaches you to toughen up and that, you know, toughening up is this uh, 
very specific, narrow, again, conditioned way of being, right? It's a very clear black and white world we live in when the truth is, hey, like to, to admit that I was wrong, to apologize, to ask for forgiveness, to then forgive myself, that takes guts. You know, it takes a big person. <laughs> All right, so let's get personal. I'm sure um, women who are listening to this, yes. uh, many women will be listening on the replay. If you're doing that, definitely let us know in the comments. Type a replay and uh, ask her any questions. She's absolutely amazing. But let's get a little personal. And uh, I would love to know uh, what is your current stage? Like, where are you at? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for asking. So what's interesting about this is that you can have different parts of you stuck in different stages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so uh, not to get too, too geeky, because I love to like nerd out on this. <laughs> But I have definitely have experienced all six stages. And I think I'm in the place right now of Of, of like going between stage six and four, right? So like I, I accept all of it, but then I, I go into this new stage of discovery because I unlock another part of conditioning that I didn't even know I had until I experienced it, until I, 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 I'm able to have the, the observant and the witness, like you mentioned earlier, to see wait a minute, something's happening where I'm being forceful. This isn't coming easy to me. Like it's, I, I'm not experiencing harmony. I'm, I'm experiencing um, effort. Oh, that's because I'm pushing through something. Oh, what am I pushing through? Whoa, I had this conditioning. Whoa, I'm discovering the conditioning. Okay, let me whip up some sex magic around this for healing. <laughs> you know? And then I go through the healing and I'm like, Oh, that was so beautiful. And now I have compassion for anyone who experiences forcefulness, you know, whether it's, uh, I was forcing blowjobs at one point, you know, my throat would shut down and I just didn't want to give a blowjob and I didn't understand why until I remember that that was like the number one no, no in high school, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of girls would give blowjobs so they, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have to have sex so strange uh but then giving a blow job was like the biggest taboo that almost having sex was less taboo than giving a blow job there was this very strange um name calling you know i remember one of the names was like you're, you're a chicken head if chicken. you give a, if you give head and that was like that was like a that was a bad thing you did not want to be a chicken head <laughs> We make these things up, you know? And so I remember I had all this conditioning. Oh, it, it, gets, it gets even worse, but it's kind of funny. So when I was 14 and I was in love with my high school sweetheart, he really wanted a blowjob. And I was so terrified that I took aluminum wrap, like tinfoil that you wrap your food in. And I put it around his, his cock and his penis uh, to like, To, to make him say, like, I don't want this. You know, if this is how it's going to happen, I don't want this. And I remember running into him later in my adult life, and he was like, Rhea, every time I see tinfoil and aluminum wrap, I run out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Memory for life. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. You know, it's like, oh, that, like, hurts my heart. But when I really think back, I'm like, wow, what kind of conditioning did I, you know, go through and how much did I have to push through to, mm -hmm. to, to experience years, years of such impressionable, precious, uh, you know, teenage years of my life around giving a blowjob around this beautiful, you know, temple of my beloved, like the lingam, you know, the penis is a wand of light. And that wherever the, the penis touches. Wand of light. I've never heard that before. Wow. Yeah. Lingam, it's a wand of light. And every stroke brings more love and more light into me. I mean, having sex from that place versus like, ah, it's so different. It changes the game. 
yes, I want every single woman to like <laughs> into their mind and into their heart, into their wombs. It's exclusive. Ex- yes. So uh, before we start to wrap up, I would love to know from you as women are listening to this, they are sort of understanding the stages and they are finding themselves. I would say most women in this group are mm-hmm. in the stage four, in the discovery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like mm-hmm. looking for the guidance, the solution, the yes. answer, the healing. So most women would be in the discovery. Um, so what would you say is like uh, the next step or what needs mm-hmm. to happen to actually channel from one stage to another, knowing what you share is mm-hmm. a natural mm-hmm. development of human sexuality, but also knowing uh, what both you and I know on a very deep level, there is such a power in having a container, having a mentor, having someone mm. taking you step by step through this, knowing the process, holding uh, holding the same net for you. What would you say, like, what is the process of getting from the discovery stage into the sacred sexuality stage? Mm, beautiful, beautiful question, yes. Um, I would say to really just rub your nose in it. Just, just keep going for it. You know, it's like, no matter how much you work out and let's say you get a rock solid bodybuilder body, right? No matter how fit you are, no matter how much money you make, no matter how famous you get, none of these things mean you have accepted yourself. Like self acceptance is the, the most extraordinarily rewarding journey no matter how beautiful, rich, and famous you are. Because we know plenty of beautiful, rich, and famous people who haven't accepted themselves. Or hanging and themselves, so, committing suicide. Yeah. 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 And so whenever we seek validation outside of ourselves, uh, it, we won't ever get in touch with that void. And the void, that hole that we feel, you know, the the apathy or you know just wherever we feel dead inside just go after it you know really look at yourself look at your shadows and why not do it in a beautiful supportive container like sexy confidence and under the guise of like the most incredible you know uh woman hero you know dogmar who can like hold point for that you know it's like someone who's gone through it like definitely um a hundred percent i would say look for a mentor that really resonates for you uh that really speaks to you for your journey and have someone who's gone through this help guide you because sure you can you know do it on your own but it might just uh, take a couple extra years and why not get the shortcuts so that you can really dive in. And then I think another piece here is to really, how do you learn, right? Because how we learn as children is not the same how we learn as adults. And so adult learning to really think about, am I a visual learner, auditory or kinesthetic? These are some good frameworks to think about. There's other uh, learning tests you can take online for free. Just figure out what's the best learning style because maybe an online course might be a really good fit for you or maybe going to a workshop or an event and being live in person could really work for you or maybe just do all of it, right? Like that's me. I like to dive in head first and then figure things out later. Um, But figure out what works for you. Not everyone is built the same way and just really Um, Take yourself out on this date that you don't have to have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. And that's what makes life worth living because I'm so curious and interested and hungry to keep going deeper and deeper. (laughs) Beautiful, beautiful. And I would say there's definitely like a distinguishing factor that when you are devoted to your sexual development, it puts you in connection with life um, yes. It creates profound sense of curiosity, profound sense of mm. wonder around healing and moving forward and finding the new answers, always knowing that that is like you are on the path of evolution, which is extraordinary. 
So gorgeous. Yes. Yeah. You have blew my mind. You have blew my yeah. mind. But I'm like, wow, this, this framework is gold. is worth a gold mine. And you mm. have uh, invoked something deep inside of me. And I'm absolutely positive, mm. absolutely certain that you have invoked something very powerful and beautiful in the amazing women that are listening and watching on replay. If you're watching right now, if you're listening right now, give some hearts, give some love for Leah. She's the mm. absolute <laughs> power. And I'm positive that there'll be women who want to learn more from you. Uh, so what is the best way to get in touch with you? Absolutely. You know, uh, send me a private message here on Facebook. Leave a comment on this thread. Uh, I would love to gift uh, anyone who's watching or is interested, gift you. I did a video series on the six stages. And uh, yeah, just say yes and leave a comment here or a heart. And I'd be happy to send them to you. It'll be my gift to you. That sounds incredible. Thank you so much, Ria. It's been such an honor. And I think I'm going to practice them singing <laughs> sexuality tonight. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> such a pleasure. It's such an honor to be here. I adore you and I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been an honor. So let's make it happen, gorgeous woman. Um, mm -hmm. Comment below. And Ria yeah, will be super excited to share this exquisite video series with you. Uh, sending you so much love, gorgeous woman. And yeah, let's make some sexual evolution magic inside of um, yay <laughs> so much love my love namaste okay goodbye ciao